It's The World This Week. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Joining us from London uh, to kick off a new season, Nico Hines, world editor of The Daily Beast. How are you? I'm well. Been missing everyone. Good <laughs> evening. It, it, it's France. We have summer breaks. Uh, with us as well, Ana Navarro Pedro, Paris correspondent uh, for Portuguese News Weekly. Vizao, how are things? Things are good. Thank you. Good. Uh, Vivian Walt, Paris correspondent for Time Magazine. How are, how are you? Very good. Thank Very you. good. Okay. All right. And Patrick Smith, editor in chief of the Africa Report. What is the news? The news is there is a fistful of coups on the <laughs> continent, and we're trying to get to the root of it. Hold that thought. You can listen, like, and subscribe to The World This Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. When the week began, it was all about France defying an ultimatum by Niger's coup leaders to recall its ambassador. That's still ongoing. We'll get back to it. But now, another precinct heard from. Toutes les institutions de la République sont dissoutes. A double surprise in the night from Gabon Wednesday. Military brass cancelling the flawed re-election to a third term of Ali Bongo. Instead, it's a coup that ends a 55-year-old's father-son dynasty in that oil-rich Central African nation. His announcement came just an hour after results had been announced in the dead of night that claimed Bongo was victorious. And of course, quick to emerge from the pack, the head of the Republican Guard, General Brice Oligui Ngema, himself a cousin of the Bongos. As for the deposed uh, president, well, he uh, spoke on uh, Wednesday, uh, seemingly from his palace, but it's not clear. I'm Ali Bongo Ondimba, president of Gabon, and I'm to send a message to all the friends that we have all over the world to tell them to make noise, to make noise for the people here have arrested me and my family. My son is somewhere, my wife is is in another place and I'm at the residence. Right now, I'm at the residence and nothing happening, nothing is happening. I don't know what, what's going on. So I'm calling you to make the noise, to make noise, to make noise, really. Patrick Smith, what was your reaction when you first heard that? It's a very old fashioned sort of coup. I mean, I think that's the, uh, the, fir the first response, you know, and we are in 20, 2023. <laughs> it seems more like 1966 uh, or 1983 in Nigeria. You know, the, a bunch of generals come in. They say oh, the election was fraudulent. The government's corrupt. Uh, the ruling class is in bed with the comprador businesses. Um, it, you, all the lines were, you know, are 40, 50 years old. Um, so that, that side of it, I think it, the Gabonese coup is very different from the Mali, Niger and Guinea coups. Um, you know, it, they did actually have a cause in, in Gabon, uh, the, the dissatisfaction with the election. But the more you dig into it, the more you realize that this is a, a, an intra-system coup that, that, as you said in the intro, Ngema is, uh, is, is part of the uh, Bongo family. He comes from the same part of the country as the, bong, uh, as the Bongos do. Um, and he may well have the backing of several, several senior members of the, the Bongo clan. So this is not a kind of a radical upstart. This is a general who's done very well out of the system. He has a property portfolio in Maryland, in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area of the United States. Um, you know, he is no radical. So uh, I think we're looking at a kind of continuity with a general taking over who clearly has political ambitions. Mm. And yet we saw celebrations, of course, in, in the street uh, after the announcement. The bongos for 55 years, they've been synonymous uh, with Gabon. Well, I think there you have it. 55 year dynasty, as you know, the report said. And, you know, that, that can be in a way said about several countries in the region, that there's simply a kind of push to rejuvenate with the 
emphasis on juvenate. I mean, it's a young continent. You've got these old sclerotic leaders um, who have been around forever, and there's no path to renewal. So eventually the system is going to break apart, and that's what we've been seeing for three years now. All right. For the, for the opposition candidate in last Saturday's election, there's no need to suspend the Constitution, as has happened. He says, just count the votes. It's not a coup, it's a palace revolution. General Ngema is Ali Bongo's cousin. We know who's behind Ngema. The Bongo system continues. And Navarro Pedro, your thoughts on that? Uh, we don't know if it's true what um, this opposition leader is saying, uh, that uh, um, the system is going to, to, to be the same one with just a new cousin <laughs> on, on, in power, as Patrick said before. Um, but uh, yes, there is. Uh, if population came out and and uh, rejoiced, it's because there is really a, a hope in Africa for a new type of leadership. Um, in this case, uh, you know, the Bongo family uh, have been in power, as it was said, for 55 years, and there is a lot of petrol in a lot of exports of petrol in uh, Gabon, and they were taking a share of 18 percent of the the revenue from petrol, 18 percent for a family. How does not it go to the people? How does not it go for a much bigger economic boom and welfare of the population? There is really, uh, there is really a, a new hope and a, a new generation that can't stand these, uh, these, uh, these oligarchs of power anymore in, in Africa. And I believe Paris is not seeing it as it should. How so? Uh, there was uh, last year in the French African summit, there was this young journalist from Kenya, Kenya who told uh, Emmanuel Macron that uh, France was still was still doing a, it was not exact words, okay, but was still doing uh, its um, her uh, African policy based on a staled vision of the continent, and I think that was the best resume of the situation. Uh, I believe France is not able to, to so far, the, the Lilize is not able to see how the continent is changing, and it's still... But they've, they've tried, they've had these uh, uh, summits where they invited youth, they've had Macron go to speak to young people. Uh, well, let, let, let's listen to, 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 to Emmanuel Macron, and that brings us back to the previous coup, the one we thought we'd be talking about solely this week. Uh, expired since Sunday night was the ultimatum by Niger's new military rulers for the French ambassador to leave. But uh, Paris says it won't recognize orders from an Ill illegitimate grouping. Speaking in Paris on Monday before the annual summer seminar of French ambassadors, President Macron insisted that Sylvain Ité, his man in Niamey, was staying put. Now let's be clear, we're not militarily engaged. We must not give in to a narrative used by the coup leaders that consists of saying France has become the enemy. The problem Nigerians face today is coup leaders putting them in danger because they're giving up the fight against terrorism, because they're giving up a policy that was economically good for the population and they're losing international funding that was helping them emerge from poverty. This is the reality, and if we don't say it, who will? Now, Nico Hines, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, this Friday is kind of agreeing, saying that uh, they're concerned over the fact that uh, they don't have access to uh, areas under, uh, 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 under military zone, as it's called in Niger, where there's desperately uh, needed aid that needs to be distributed. Still, when you heard Emmanuel Macron's words there, what, what struck you? Well, I think the difficult thing for France in terms of trying to win this kind of PR battle is that it's very obvious that Macron is concerned with the French military positions. You know, Niger has been used as the kind of base for these anti-terror operations all across the Sahel. I think something like 1,500 French troops have been there and have kind of set up this as a kind of um, a battle station. Uh, and, and often with these kind of post-colonial uh, or uh, 
arguments between kind of Western countries and, 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 and growing economies, you often get this, oh, all they care about is the military side. All they care about is um, the kind of the troops and how they, they can gain from Niger. Macron didn't really seem to be that concerned about how the coup is actually going to affect ordinary people. And I think it's going to be very difficult to persuade people in that swathe of Africa that France really does care about people because of its history. I know that they've tried to improve relations and that they've been working very hard, but ultimately it's a really hard argument to win after a century of colonialism. Yeah, Britain doesn't seem to have the same problem as France does, well, Vivian Walt. Exactly. I mean, we, we've had something like... A seven coups in the last uh, couple of years. Eight if you region. include Chad. Right, exactly. Eight, nine. pardon me. Nine, well. Nine. <laughs> this goes nine. On. They say nine in three years, yeah, if you include them, the latest, yeah. Okay. And uh, you have to count afterwards. they are all former French colonies. Um, uh, but the, the Sudan, though. Yeah. Well, that, does that count Sudan. as a coup? Okay. That's a pardon coup. Me. Yeah, for sure it's a coup. Yeah, so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as certainly there's more than what Macron calls narrative of, of being anti-France. There is a fairly um, strong anti-France feeling, certainly among you know, young people in this region. There's been tremendous tensions over you know, uh, immigration, all sorts of issues. And, um, and uh, you know, witness the fact that uh, President Bongo uh, records his addresses, you know, helps, you know, save me in English, not in French. Um, so, you know, I think that beyond what's going on week by week, you have like this whole power struggle of who actually holds, you know, what external power holds the, you know, has clout in this region. And you have Russia and China moving in big um, and France, France's power, other than military, effectively diminishing. All right, lots of reactions on Twitter about the coup contagion in French-speaking uh, Africa, including this from Malcolm. A disconnect between populations and their highly French-linked elite, too far removed from the people on the ground, but too close to the French establishment. Is that the problem, Patrick Smith, or is it simply that uh, no matter how much you try, if, for instance, you know, this is on the African leaders who yeah. still want to have their money printed in France. The CFA franc is printed uh, in France, a common currency. Uh, how far are you going to get in, in, in distancing yourself from that perception that Vivian was talking about? Well, I would widen the aperture, really. I, I, you know, I don't think it's just about France. I mean, France is an easy target because uh, of its overwhelming post-colonial, neo-colonial presence in Africa. But there's a growing frustration with the international system. You've seen the, the, the flight of capital from the developing world, the entire developing world, $80 billion so far this year. A lot of that has come out of Africa. Then you've got the illicit flows of capital from Africa. That's another probably 70, 80 billion so far. So you've got plus the heightened geopolitical tensions. So you think you've had a loss of faith in democracy uh, across the world. So I think you've got to add all those things together. And um, I was talking to some friends in Nigeria and Ghana and Sierra Leone and Kenya this week about their their view of it. And they're saying, you know, <laughs> Western leaders shouldn't kid themselves that this is restricted to Francophone countries. It's not. There's a lot of unease uh, and discontent mounting at the worsening socioeconomic conditions across the continent. It can't just be blamed on a sort of a, a post-colonial francophone relationship. That's, that's an extreme expression of that, but it, it, it's a serious matter right across Africa. Just a quick final word on this, because uh, it was brutal to fight for independence in Portugal's former African colonies. Again, there doesn't seem to be the same kind of resentment that there is. No, we left and, and left with civil wars going on in, the, yeah. in those colonies, and called them Mozambique, for instance. Uh, but there was no action of uh, neo-colonialism from, uh, from Portugal towards uh, the former colonies. It was different. Portugal was a dictatorship. The dictatorship came down through a putsch, a military putsch. And, um, and, uh, and, and then there was uh, this decolonization, maybe too hasty. Uh, but um, the relationship between Lisbon and the, for the capitals of the former colonies has no neo-colonial colonial, um, imprint. Actually, there have been some scandals of uh, 
corruption between leaders in Portugal and leaders from the former Shocking. colonies. <laughs> Isn't it? <that>? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you heard Vivian talking about uh, the uh, other powers uh, f uh, moving in and uh, jockeying for position. Uh, guess who paid a call on coup leaders uh, who've left open their border with Niger this week? Russia's deputy defense minister, Yunus Bek Yevgrov, in Burkina Faso Thursday to offer his services uh, to junta leader uh, Ibrahim uh, Traore. Uh, it's interesting. Um, is it to to see the, the the visuals of this at this particular time, uh, Patrick Smith, because this is the same Yevgorov who was in Libya recently. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Libya, I think, was the big focus of the Wagner Group's mm -hmm. empire in Africa. They had, if you remember, they've been helping uh, Hafta, uh, the 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 putschist from eastern uh, Libya, who was fighting the regime in. Tripoli. Uh, weirdly enough, he was an ally of uh, the Egyptian president, El Sisi. Um, and so that was part of that sort of Russian uh, Russian network. Um, and I think they're very concerned. They don't they don't lose that uh, that presence in Libya, uh, strategically supported, uh, positioned on the southern Mediterranean um, and also uh, the, it, their position in the Sahelian state. So I think that that tells you all you need to know about the the foreign ministry and the defense ministry in Moscow's determination mm. to continue with the Wagner Group's activities under a new label. And uh, is yet, we're yet to see what that label is. But I have no doubt that the Wagner presence will be rebadged and continue in those countries. And it will suit both sides of the relationship. Well, there seems to be still some pushback. The, the, the Grey Zone Telegram channel on Thursday publishing images of the late Wagner Group leader on what was his last trip of the continent. To those talking about whether I'm alive or not, how I'm doing, it's the weekend now, the second half of August 2023, and I'm in Africa. For those who like to discuss my elimination, my private life, income or other things, well, basically, I'm fine. Of course, Nico Hines, we know what happened next. <laughs> he wasn't fine for long, was he? Uh, uh, it was interesting to see that video emerge. I'm not quite sure who thought it was a, a good PR move to get that footage out there this week because um, it kind of made Prigozhin look a little foolish. Um, but I do think very interesting that Africa was his last trip. And as we've been saying, that the Russians are desperate to keep this up. Because I think if we just look back for a second at what we were talking about, you know, in Burkina Faso, for example, Wagner was very much involved in what went on over there as the coup unfolded. You know, Wagner had been offering its services to the incumbent president and soon after he had turned them down suddenly uh, a coup had taken place we don't exactly know how much Wagner had a hand in the coup itself um, but certainly it seems as though they were beneficiaries and that they were in the background supporting it and pushing this anti-French narrative uh, and it absolutely will continue across Africa post Prigozhin. The question is will they put a new leader in to try and keep those um, existing networks in place because it's all very well to say oh let's just send in some new Russians to do the deal but the, the point is a lot of these individuals have become trusted by the African leaderships by the governments um, and so there's going to be a big job to either replace Wagner wholesale or whether they can put a new leader in who can maintain the existing relationships. And we saw this week uh, Vivian Walter the uh, funeral uh, uh, in St. Petersburg uh, the press was kept uh, uh, at bay on Monday uh, for that ceremony. And then the, the day after, we s saw images of uh, people uh, who uh, were going to the grave site to lay flowers. There's still a bit of a cult of Prigozhin. It is just astonishing that you have this very, very private, almost secretive funeral of this larger-than-life character that's been so kind of Rambunctious. For some and reason, Vladimir Putin was busy that day. He, yeah, he couldn't make it just enough, to yeah. pay homage to his his best friend. He was too busy investigating the plane crash, I guess. Ah, so, right. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know what's uh, 
What's interesting is, like Patrick says, I mean, certainly the Kremlin is going to be very determined to hang on to not just the influence in Africa, and we keep coming back to Africa, but also the real assets. Um, you have gold, timber, I mean, real valuable natural resources that Prigozhin um, effectively controlled. And, um, and those will be kind of assets that, uh, you know, the Russian leadership will not want to slip, let slip through their fingers. So deniable and parallel, parallel networks and deniable networks. I mean, you know, their uh, Prigozhin was trading gold from Sudan to the United Arab Emirates entirely separately from the Russian state apparatus. That that gives them a, an income source that's absolutely sealed off from sanctions. You know, because these are all companies outside the ambit of those sanctions, most of them. But we've seen in the last uh, weeks, and I'll put it to Anna Navarro Pedro, uh, the Russian president, uh, the, the, the Kremlin saying, well, actually, yes, he does work for us. Uh, uh, <laughs> but of course, uh, and there was no doubt, you cannot be uh, a mercenary. Uh, or I, I guess my company. question is, it can you have plausible deniability twice? <laughs> I don't think that that question keeps Putin awake at night. <laughs> um, the thing is, the 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 thing is, um, uh, Wagner will go on. I, we don't know how, but will go on because absolutely necessary to, to Russian diplomacy uh, abroad, and it's necessary for fighting in Ukraine. Um, we don't know actually what happened. Prigozhin was this per person bigger than life, as you said, but he was not a real leader of Wagner. He was not the founder of Wagner. I believe Putin put him, because he was a good PR, uh, on the head of the company, but the real leader, and that is the interesting thing for me, was Utkin. He was the one, he was a military, he was... Um, His number two was shot down in the same he plane. He was not a number two, he was the number one, the real was number he? He one. He started the company. He started the yeah. company, he was a mercenary, so-called mercenary, actually he was a, a military, a Russian military in Syria, he was from the GRU, uh, which is the, the um, intelligence, uh, the, the Russian military intelligence. And he was, I mean, Prigozhin could not develop uh, the, 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 the fighting, the, the military uh, strategy, uh, the organization of a military company with alone. He could not. He, he was not. He was the face of Wagner. But the ones who were killed with him, that is the interesting thing. Because mm -hmm. Utkin, when you see the, the image of the man after 20 years, of this fighting, of 50 years of this fighting, that man had crossed a line that he'll never come back from. And and, it, yes, and, and, and apparently they didn't kill the number three, the one who's number three who's now taking care of Wagner, put in charge of Wagner, but they do, did kill all the ones who, also the ones who were um, um, actually the managers of the, the business, the side business of uh, gold and mines and so forth uh, by Prigozhin. So, yeah, we don't know what is going on, but it's... Um, it's so just a quick final word on this, Nico Hines, because we were talking about it Monday, uh, just as that funeral was, uh, was, was going to take place. And uh, the question the panel was asking itself, and we couldn't find an answer other than hubris, why were Utkin and Prigozhin on the same plane? Yeah, well, it seems like a very foolish mistake, doesn't it? I can't imagine that they had been lured on there by a genius FSB agent's kind of honey trap because um, I think what we've come to see from the FSB and the GRU and the other um, security services in Russia is that they're more bungling idiots than operat operat operating geniuses. Um, so I would just put that down to foolishness on the part of Wagner. And I think if we look back to that clip that we just watched of him saying, everything's fine, I'm okay. It seems like Prigozhin really did believe that somehow he would be allowed to carry out a mutiny against Vladimir Putin on his own land, killing Russian troops and be allowed to get away with it scot-free. Turning our attention uh, here to uh, uh, what's been happening uh, closer to, uh, the, to uh, uh, Britain and to France, uh, Spain, winners of the World Cup, uh, Women's World Cup, highest ratings ever, uh, and yet overshadowed uh, by now by a scandal. Last Friday, everyone gathered for what they thought was a resignation speech. Instead, Spanish Football Federation President Luis Rubiales stunned the world 
by defying the outrage over his forced kiss of World Cup winning striker Henny Hermoso, refusing to quit one week on, he's still hanging on, despite the shame expressed now by the likes of the men's national team coach Luis de la Fuentes. I attended the assembly convinced, as the majority of the people there, I insist, convinced that we were attending the protocol farewell act of a president, but it became a different situation that overwhelmed many of us, and believe me, for which I was not prepared for. I repeat, I give you my deepest apologies. What did you make of first that applause last Friday when... I still can't come over, get over it. He always is saying, I will not resign, I will not resign, I will not resign. And the men in the room are applauding and, you know, cheering. The women standing like this, but frozen. the men are 90 percent, right, of the Federation? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, no. It's uh, quite astonishing. Uh, uh, and, and it's more, all the more astonishing because Spain is a country that has been... Uh, uh, kind of leading in Europe the movement against domestic violence with laws and with um, social action to protect women. Um, but strange enough, the Me Too movement is not as, uh, has not been as uh, developed in Spain as in other countries in Europe or the United States. Is it, is it a, a Spanish problem or is it a... Uh football governing body problem we've had we've had sex scandals here in the at the french football federation okay, yes you have uh, that's, that's one question v vivian walt uh let me read to you what spain's olympic chief said this friday he calls the force kissed inappropriate unacceptable but also calls it an isolated incident hmm. apparently not if you listen to the you know women's footballers of spain but, you know, as you said, it's just, I think, maybe six months after the French Football Federation head had to, was forced out um, over sexual harassment scandals. Um, and, uh, you know, this is in some ways a football problem. It's a massively lucrative business that is overwhelmingly male run. Um, and yet you have increasingly these women's teams and the Women's World Cup that are, as you said, it's the record, record viewers. Um, and uh, certainly in the U.S., they're now being paid the same. So um, it's, uh, it's like an old world, new world culture clash in some ways. Um, and I think, actually, Patrick, the figures are even more than 90 percent, as far as I know. I have, out of the 140 members of the Spanish Football Federation, six are women. Wow. Um, mm. So um, that's would account for Rubiales' confidence, I guess. <laughs> right, exactly. As, uh, yeah. But there is, I mean, there's a, there has been a political move. I mean, uh, I mean, since the end of the uh, the right wing uh, dominance of French politics, uh, sorry, of Spanish politics. French politics next, but <laughs> Spanish politics, um, the, the, the series of left-wing governments have moved towards uh, more gender rights, passing um, pro-women legislation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, outlawing discrimination against women. Uh, and so, I, in, a, in a way, this is, it's, not, it's not an exception, certainly. But it, it's a bit of a shock to the system after the, those years of progress that we're still stuck in the sort of scandal that would have typified social events maybe 20, 30 years ago. You know, uh, there is a, a study about a year or two years ago by a lawyer's firm in Spain. And they said six, they found out 67 percent of Spanish women had been uh, harassed and uh, the target of inappropriate behavior uh, in, in, in the workplace. Um, but women don't come out like in Portugal, women don't come out easily and point fingers and say names. They will state the situation, but not uh, not uh, give names or accuse someone specifically. I think there is a very uh, Catholic Latin culture in, uh, in this um, well, behavior. Actually, I think Anna makes a really good point, which is um, if this had not been on global networks uh, broadcast around mm -hmm. the world, would we ever have known about it? Who would have spoken up? Would there have been any protests? Um, 
and how many uh, such incidents are happening. This is a workplace, actually. Um, how many such incidents are happening away from any, you know, visibility? All right. It's a, it, it, I just wanted to say about the FIFA stand against it, which is yeah. a, a somewhat progressive. <laughs> uh, I, I, but, but it took a long time in coming. It took a long time to come. It took in, a week I, for Gianni but you, Infantino but you've to got speak to, up. You've got to kind of set that against FIFA's history of <laughs> grand corruption and obfuscation of that grand corruption and uh, uh, sexism. So it's pretty, it, it, when, when it comes to FIFA to be the referee in a case like this, you know, it shows we're really in trouble. <laughs> Nico Hines, do you agree? Yeah, you don't want to be relying on FIFA as your moral arbiter. I definitely <laughs> agree with that. Um, but, the, um, but the Spanish FA have got some form with for this. You know, it, it was a little while ago, but it was this century that uh, Luis Aragones was the coach of the Spanish national men's team. And he made a racist remark about Thierry Henry. Um, and obviously there was some up, uproar in France at the time, and there was huge uproar in England because Henri was playing here in London for Arsenal. Um, and the Spanish FA just came out and said, yeah, he said it. It wasn't really the right thing to say, but we're not going to suspend him. We're not going to sack him. And they just carried on. He was carried on being the manager for years to come. Um, so Spain definitely has had a poor record when it comes to the football authorities doing the right thing. And you, you said it's that there's a, a, an element of Catholic culture in all of this. The, is it, why? Is it because of Rubiales' mother went on a hunger strike inside a church? <laughs> no, 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 by no means. It's just, it's the same in Portugal. And I believe in Italy, it's a lot, very difficult. I, just, I believe there is a, a, a part of shame uh, of uh, coming out and speaking publicly. Uh, but you know, the man, he, he just before, he was ne standing next to the Queen of Spain and uh, uh, the princess uh, um, heir to say. the throne and he just excuse me for the picture the very very um, graphic graphic <laughs> picture but he just grabbed his genitals and he banged them you know to 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 to, to congratulate the, the the victory so i mean he apologized to the queen afterwards but still i mean such he, grace such <laughs> grace, yes. It, it's about more than Spain. At a ceremony on Thursday, Serena Wiegmann, she's the manager of Runners Up England. Uh, yes, yeah, Spain defeated England in the final. She yes. dedicated her UEFA Manager of the Year award to the winners. We all know um, the issues around the Spanish team, and it really hurts me as a coach, as a mother of two daughters, as a wife, and as a human being. And it shows, we just talked about 88, the, the game has grown so much, but there's also still a long way to go in women's football and in society. And I would like to dedicate this award to the Spanish team, the team that played on the World Cup, such great football that everyone enjoyed. And she gets applause there. Uh, Nico Hines, uh, again, this was uh, an unprecedented result uh, for both Spain and England reaching the final. Uh, and uh, it kind of spoils the party for both, you might say. Yeah, I think this speech by Wigman, though, really does uh, restore some pride to the whole episode because what's been clear since this um, kind of came big on the t you know, it, it happened during the, at the end of the game, and I think many people noticed at the time, and then it ballooned and ballooned over the next few days. And what became very obvious was that the women on the England team were absolutely um, coming out and giving their full support to the Spanish team. And mm -hmm. on the pitch, the Spanish team absolutely ran rings around England. It was um, a real masterclass. And it was amazing to see Wiegmann just then saying, not only does she and the rest of the Lionesses uh, England team support the women against Rubiales, against this ridiculous sexist behaviour, but also paying tribute to just how brilliantly they played. I thought that was uh, really, really good losing uh, mm. from the English. All right, yeah. good, good sportsmanship, uh, re restoring uh, uh, honour to the beautiful game. What does a strike by Hollywood actors and writers say about how much the world uh, depends on movies made in Tinseltown? The stars have not come out for the annual Deauville Film Festival on France's Normandy coast. This year, there'll be no Natalie Portman, no Jude Law, no Joseph Gordon-Levitt, no Peter Dinklage. Instead, 
It'll be a, a lot of independent fare. Over in Venice, Adam Driver did walk the red carpet, but only because the star of the movie Ferrari has the backing of a film with independent distribution that is all in for negotiations with the unions. A driver who, as reported by the Daily Beast, blasted big boys Amazon and Netflix and expressed a solidarity with the strike. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting story because Vivian Walt, here we are, this summer of huge Hollywood blockbusters, Barbie and Oppenheimer, that have broken all these records, and now there's a strike. It is incredible, and having just been in California myself, um, it was incredible that you actually had to book days ahead to get a, a movie ticket to one of these movies. Um, they mm -hmm. simply were booked out for days. So, you know, movies are back in a major way, um, and yet L.A. is a depressed town right now. Um, the movie industry is huge, and um, it makes an enormous difference. How dependent are we on Hollywood? Very dependent um, for all the you know incredibly rich material coming out of Europe and Asia and independent movies and documentaries. This is still an industry that's heavily dominated by Hollywood. And I think that's clear from these uh, festivals, not only Deauville, of course, but Venice. So, Yeah, bo bo both in Venice uh, and in Deauville. Uh, Nico Hines, uh, the, uh, the standoff, and you, again, Adam Driver was uh, blasting Amazon and Netflix uh, in, in, in that press conference uh, at, the, at the screening. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought that was great that Adam Driver was willing to actually name names. Usually actors are so scared to actually point the finger directly. They uh, usually make kind of say something positive about their side and then kind of make a vague illusion. Um, but it was quite good to see him naming and shaming Amazon, which, let's face it, is what? The world's richest company or certainly up there. There's no way that they can't afford to pay decent residuals, decent fees, decent wages. And obviously the actors are part of this, but also it's the writers who, for a lot large part, get by on kind of minimum wage um, and really unreliable incomes. Um, one thing that I'm hoping that's going to come out of this, and, and you know, we'd be, there's been a lot more coverage of Ferrari over the last few days as a result of the fact that it was made by independent makers who had stuck to these um, these uh, approved rights for the actors and for the writers. Um, therefore, Adam Driver's up front on camera. Therefore, we're all talking about Ferrari. I I've noticed the similar thing happening. We had um, on the biggest uh, film podcast over in Britain uh, last week, Louis Garrel was on there talking about The Innocence, which is just coming out in England. And normally, you'd never get a look in for a French film like that. It would normally be some sort of Hollywood blockbuster. They would have had a, a big um, Hollywood actor there talking about their film. So I'm hopeful at least that this is a little window for the smaller films, for independent films who are run in good ways and for European cinema to get a bigger, bigger chance to show their talents and show off their fantastic filmmaking as well. Anna Navarro Pedro? Um, you know, um, this strike reminds me of something, something that I read some time ago, long time ago. There was this very famous director, movie director in the 40s, 50s. I can't remember his name. He was a big star. And everybody talked about how, what a genius he was. And one day his, his writer, his screenplay writer, sent him uh, a screenplay and he opened it, and it was all white. There was nothing printed on it, and only this sentence, now use your genius. <laughs> <laughs> and it's exactly, there is no film if there isn't a screenwriter, if there isn't a, if there isn't a writers. And um, uh, the directors and the, the actors get the big share of the, the, the budget, and the rest of the people are just living, uh, you know, scarce, difficult by, difficult with difficulty by. So it's um, it's a very good movement. Um, and yes, and uh, as it was said before, maybe we could push 
European movies. <laughs> a yeah, because bit. we began this th this hour talking about Africans uh, wanting to write their own stories, mm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, write you know, yep. and and uh, here you have uh, Vivian saying how well, when it comes to movies, mm. we're all dependent on tinsel. Well, yeah, on one level, I think. But, well, uh, maybe sit, sitting sitting in Los Angeles, people feel to be very dependent on Tinseltown for all sorts of reasons. But actually, numerically, I mean, India has put makes far more films than Hollywood. And now Nigeria, Nigeria makes... Uh, is the second cool. biggest filmmaking country in the world now, after after India. Uh, you know, if you you'd set, told someone that 40 years ago, they would have laughed in your face. Part of that is the new technology and the new techniques people are using. And, uh, you know, you can argue about production values and all the rest of it. Mm. But that is changing. And, and those films are not just being consumed in Nigeria. They're being consumed right across the African continent. That's 1.4 billion people. But across Asia, across Latin America, before it was all one way. You know, the, the Latin American uh, soap operas, telegram dramas and so on would get uh, beamed across satellite TV to West Africa, and then Central Africa and Southern Africa eventually. Now it's going the other way. Because the, know, world's, become, the world's become a, small, a smaller yep. place. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of the fun of going to the movies is going to the movie, but then afterwards talking about it at the water cooler yep. uh, with other people who've gone to see the same movie. Uh, is the, will those African movies make it to the global water cooler the way South Koreans uh, have a, to a certain Well, degree? I mean, a friend in Brazil was telling me that uh, there's an Ivoirian soap opera in Brazil that's become a sort of cult feature. It's translated into Portuguese from the French, wow. and it's become really, really sort of, you know, compulsory weekend viewing there. So, um, yeah, I, I, th I think there's a good chance it will. I think we are getting a bit more international. I think, uh, yeah. I, I think the West is so. We in the West are so arrogant that we believe if we don't do it and if it doesn't it doesn't get our uh, blessing, uh, it won't work. But <laughs> it does, and they don't need us. <laughs> yeah. So, so Nico Hines, besides Barbie and Oppenheimer, have you seen any other movies during the summer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think those two um, pretty much uh, took the biscuit, didn't they? There's a new one um, coming out called Scrapper, um, which I don't know if it's come over to France yet, but it's a British movie um, mm. that everyone is saying is fantastic. Very funny, kind of working class, but with um, humour rather than the traditional kind of Mike Lee sadness. So that's one to look out for. All right. Well, well that's a, a hot tip. We'll leave it there. I want to thank you, uh, Nico Hines, uh, for joining us uh, from London. I want to thank uh, Vivian Walt, Anna Navarro, Pedro, Patrick Smith. Uh, just a programming reminder, The World This Week returns in a fortnight next Friday. We'll be live from New Delhi and the G20 Summit for a special edition.